And what happened during the Athenstedt incident? In the summer of 1982, uh, I was involved in a particularly uh, dramatic detention at an East German Air Force early warning radar site in a small town called Artenstedt, almost by the inner German border between East and West Germany. I had been sent out with the new brigadier, who was our boss, and uh, he was traditionally sent out with young officers for a few uh, patrols early on in his time, and the theory was that we could show him the ropes, but it also gave him a chance to, to get a feel for the young officers he was employing. My instructions from the operations officer were to take the brigadier out. Whatever you do, don't get him into any trouble. Let him take lots of photographs. We don't expect any of them much to be in focus. It doesn't matter. Just give him a feel for what it's all about mm. and bring him home in one piece. So we'd spent a day out and about. We'd been trailed by the secret police, who were a constant factor, particularly when someone as senior as the brigadier was out on tour. And these were the East German? East German secret yeah. police, the Stasi. And eventually we thought we'd broken clear of them and we aimed for uh, an area near, as I say, the inner German border, an area that was inbounds to us, so there was nothing illegal about the area we were planning to transit through. And it looked to me like a perfectly clear run. I could go west towards the border and then turn south uh, and we'd eventually do a big loop and go home to Potsdam and thence to, mm. to West Berlin. However, I had not appreciated that at the end of my western planned route and before I turned south there was an East German radar station in this near the village of Artenstedt. Mm. So we were um, bumbling along in an area with no military installations or anything. And you not, came over the brow of the hill? Not aware of the secret police particularly and we came over the brow of the hill and there in the distance was a radar site with a series of antennas nodding going round and round and so forth. And the brigadier went, oh look, he said, there's a radar site. And I said, yes, sir, but don't worry about it. We let the Royal Air Force members of the mission deal with things like that. It's a bit boring, really, antennas. We don't do that, so don't worry about that. Oh, he said, OK. So we drove on a bit further, and as we came out of the village of Artenstedt, we passed a mission restriction sign. Now, there are about, allegedly, 10,000 of these signs littering uh, East Germany, and they'd been put up, uh, and the sign said, members of military missions must not go past this point. Uh, however, they were not mentioned in the 1946 agreement with the Soviets, and so we, as well as the Americans and the French, always claimed that they didn't have any legal status because they weren't mentioned in the 1946 agreement. So for us, they were an advertisement, there's something interesting going on behind them. But to the Soviets and the East Germans, they had some degree of restriction built into them. Anyway, we came to this sign and the Brigadier goes, oh look, he says, there's one of those signs. And I said, yes, Brigadier, but don't you remember, we don't pay any attention to them. They're just an advertisement of something interesting going on behind. Oh, he said. So we drove on a bit further. And as we came over the crest of the hill, there to my horror was the radar site, not as I had imagined it would be 500 metres, 1,000 metres away from the side of the road, but slap bang along the side of the road. So I turned over my shoulder and said to the Brigadier, if you'd put your camera away, sir, I think that'd be a good idea. And I turned to the driver and said, and if you could put your foot on the floor, I think that would probably be good too. As we reached the, the first, the near end of the installation on our left, uh, a man jumped out from behind the car and I saw him throw a barrier across the road. And I thought, this is not going terribly well. We sped along the road in order to drive past the main gate um, and carry on, get away. And as we came to the main gate, a huge 10-ton truck came roaring out from the main gate and slammed straight into the side of our car. And we were pushed across the road and trapped between the 10-ton truck and a fruit tree, quite a small fruit tree. Uh, the fruit tree managed to stop us rolling, which would probably have resulted in our death. And so we were, found ourselves a sandwich or the meat in a sandwich between this large truck and a tree. And they got you? We were banged to rights. An East German Air Force, and very quickly a selection of secret policemen appeared and started clucking around the vehicle um, and trying to, to control the situation. A lot of the windows in the vehicle had been broken, 
Um, and I said to the brigadier, the best thing for you and me, sir, is to get out and we will confront the East German military. And the driver, who was very lucky not to be injured, the bumper of the 10-ton truck had come in through his side window and had just biffed him, I think, slightly in the head. But we left him in the vehicle and climbed out. And I said to the brigadier, what we do now, sir, is we prove that we're not rattled by this and we'll have a cup of tea. They'll expect that of us. And so we had our cup of tea. Got the thermos out. Got the thermos out, yeah. made the cup of tea. And the secret police photographers were very excited about all this. We're getting closer and closer and closer um, and insisted on taking photographs of everything. And um, at the last moment, one of them came up to me and I suddenly felt the urge and I threw my cup of coffee all over him from head to foot, uh, which caused him to recoil. And I said, turned to the brigadier, and I said, oh God, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't mean to do that, but he'd driven me to distraction. And frankly, such an odious little person, I couldn't help myself. Very good thing you did, he said. I was about to do it myself. And I went, no, no, sir, whatever else happens, you mustn't do something like that because I can be irresponsible, but you can't. Anyway, the secret police drew back a bit and we asked the East Germans, I told them that my, my general was not amused mm. um, and that they must fetch the, the Soviet commandant, Soviet military police commander, because it was only the Soviet authorities with whom we could interact in an official way. And so they That was sent, because the East Germans weren't recognised. In 1946, when the mission was set up, and indeed in 47, when the American and French missions were set up, there was no German Democratic Republic. And so the agreements we had were with the Soviet authorities. And even after the West German and East German governments had come into being, these agreements had never been changed. And so it was quite clear from the agreements that we were only to deal with the Soviet authorities. So the local military police commander was, was summoned from the Soviet garrison and took some while uh, to arrive. We knew we were making some progress with the Soviets, with rather with the East German Air Force, when eventually they produced tea for us on a sort of uh, mock silver tray. So we felt this was a sort of psychological step up. We were, we were winning the argument. Uh, the Soviets arrived and together we summoned help from Potsdam, our, our headquarters, to come and recover us. It was quite an amusing moment along the way. It didn't seem to be arriving for a long time at the help which the Soviets said they had, had called for. And so I said to the Soviet commandant, perhaps I could go and find a public telephone box just to check that something's happening. So he, he took his assistant, who was a young captain, and said, right, take Captain Williams and go off and uh, call Potsdam. So we drove off. And we came to, by this time it was dark, the accident had happened in the middle of the afternoon, it was now the early evening. And we, we found, a, perhaps nine o'clock in the evening, we found a local East German village and looked for a telephone box. Well, the only telephone box we found was vandalised, not unlike the United Kingdom, but it was something obviously irresistible to East German youths to vandalise the telephone box. So we then spotted a police station which looked to be unmanned but it had a big um, bell on the front of it or a big press button on the front of it so the Soviet officer pressed it and what actually happened was the fire or the um, bomb you know bomb air raid warning went off on the roof so the most amazing sort of siren klaxon noise went off and uh, windows started opening in the village anyway he turned to me and he said come on he said your turn you have a go so I did it too and then we jumped in his jeep and drove away quickly before the locals could uh, complain about us. Eventually, however, the, the recovery trailer and one of our vehicles towing it appeared, and much to the surprise of the, the East Germans and the Soviets, and pretty much to our own surprise, our own vehicle was able to drive up and onto the, the trailer despite the damage. And it had actually been saved more than anything by the half a ton of armour plate that had been fitted underneath the vehicle to give it rigidity. So we, we returned to uh, Potsdam and from there back to West Berlin to our main headquarters. I felt rather chuffed. I'd taken the Brigadier out. We'd had a bit of excitement. I brought him home safely after a fashion. And, um, and so I went to see the operations officer and said, I, I brought, I took him out, I brought him back. Anyway, 
he wasn't as amused as I was. He dragged me down the corridor by the ear and pointed to the large map of East Germany on which there was a sign saying, Caution, Suicide Alley. And apparently I was the only person in the British mission who'd never heard of Artenstedt and I should have known better.